I don't know that I've ever told you, Simon, how I got started. In no, I'd, I'd love to know. It's always, always exciting to find out how people get this bug and get hooked on the game. Because I know we were talking outside earlier that you never have to retire from what we're doing. No. But if I go back 37 years when I got out of college, my family had a small bookstore in Dallas. Okay. And, but the business, family business, was an insurance agency. Okay. I changed majors multiple times in college. I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. I, so I go back and get involved in the family business, which has a small bookstore over in the corner, which is kind of like a service to the community. Well, it didn't take me long to discover I dislike selling insurance, but I enjoy talking to people about books. Yeah. And so we only had 10 customers a day. So if somebody came in, I would get up from my insurance desk and go talk to them. And this is mid eighties. And invariably they would ask for a book that was out of print and I would write it down on an index card and go try to find that. And that was a whole different game back then finding books without it really a different you, different game yeah you relied on just going to bookstores to find them locally or sending letters off to other cities and that could take weeks to to get an answer but that was the beginnings um and i dabbled with the bookstore for about a year and i told my dad i would really like to do this and he says you can never make a living selling books we've had this bookstore for 10 years you can't even <laughs> pay the bills and I said, okay, another year went by and I could see that just these innovations of adding used books totally made a difference. And after two years after college, I said, I'm going to do books full time. And so I hired my best customer, a young woman who was in the bookstore frequently. We got a toll free number, a direct, we started doing direct mail, started doing used books and it just kind of took off. In the early days, my budget was $5, $10, and that's what I would stick to. But over time, it's gone to a much higher level. In 2005, though, I could see the writing on the wall with Amazon, Kindle, eBooks, digital, everything. It was destroying new books. And so I made the decision to break out of new books and focus on use more towards rare books and that's kind of how I got here. Um, the big transition though was about 15 years ago. So the first 20 years it's new and used, but that yeah. got my feet wet. That helped me understand, that, understand yeah. how everything was working. And with the advent of the internet, that didn't replace all of the people that I'd met and connections because most good acquisitions you don't find even today are not found online. I, maybe 5 to 10% of my acquisitions are an online lead. Most are meeting people like you and others who have books and buying them. But I'm very curious. I know it seems like we've known each other a lot longer, but it's it only been four fair. years. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious. Um, your early days, how you got involved? Well, I was about 12 and I went into a bookstore in Winchester. I was going for an interview at the school there. And... I was fascinated. At the beginning of the shop, there were books, you know, for a pound and two pounds, books I could maybe afford. And then as I went deeper into the shop, there was, you know, unlettered car, pigskin books, first editions. And, you know, I got very excited that this was the way that my literary heroes first appeared in the world. You know, and I found that incredibly exciting. But it's funny because I was not only interested in the material, I was interested in why one book was a pound and one book was a hundred pounds when they were to all intents. So I was very fascinated what, what made that market. I, I spent all the money I had. I actually got a very late edition of Idols of the King by Tennyson, signed by Tennyson. I think it cost me seven pounds, but it was all I had on me. I sold it later when I was at university for about 200 pounds. Um, so I, I, I wanted to actually buy and sell these things and I wanted to buy and sell the most exciting books that I could possibly find. Well, and I remember in the early days, <clears throat> I somehow thought old meant more valuable. Yes. And it didn't take me long to determine, no, yeah. why are some books 50 years old worth thousands of dollars where you can find the book that's 500 years old for even less? Yeah. And I started bit by bit. Um, I kind of stumbled into this profession. And so it's been pretty much self-taught. 
and learning about it at book fairs and other other events. But so from there, so you developed as a young person, you developed this um, passion for books. Absolutely. And I started going around, obviously, way before the Internet and discovering that, you know, in one shop, a book might be 30 pounds in another shop it was 70 pounds so I thought maybe there's a business I can sell the book that I, I could buy it for 30 pounds and sell it for 35 pounds and then literally how I started was dealing in between shops and um, you know I made mistakes and but I had some good moments too. Uh, people have <clears throat> asked me that question too have you ever bought something made a mistake and it's like yeah, yeah, all the time, <laughs> all, all, all the time. Yeah. Um, and then I've had people say, oh, I'm concerned about buying a, a fake book or a forged book. And I said, that a book, that's like buying a, a forged car. There's too many moving parts. Now, when it gets to inscriptions and other things, that's another. But, Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> but um, so where did you, where was your first book? My book, first bookstore was in Dallas. Texas. Well, I mean... And now you were working at university. I was, yeah, I was working, I was in university in Bristol. And I used to scour all the shops there and all around the West Country. And then I had a good contact. I had a lot of friends who were at Oxford. And Blackwell's in Oxford. I made a very good contact there. And so I'd scour the country and I would take them up to Blackwell's. And they'd buy a lot off me. Because I had quite a good eye and I could, was quite happy to leave a profit in things. You know, I'd take a small margin and they could make a markup. Um, I think in my final year at university, I sold £90,000 worth of books to Blackwell's. Not at a huge margin, but that was a lot. And actually, the manager of Blackwell's had me audited for profitability. He didn't know. He thought maybe there was something going on because I was selling them so many books. And it actually proved that I'd showed a profit for the company. So I was thrilled by that. Oh, that's great. You know, so... And I still I still deal with like dealing with the trade a lot. I'm quite happy to, you know, to make a short margin and because I, I just like buying. It's, it's actually the acquisition and the chase that I like most, and the meeting people and uh, people always ask me what's your favorite book, and I always <coughs> say the next one. Absolutely. Um, when was your first brick and mortar store? Like uh, where you actually had a yeah. proper shop? Y your your first one was in Dallas then. Yes. But you've, you, Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, it was in Dallas. It was part of an insurance agency. But then when I made the break, we did finally get our own separate shop. Uh, all, although even before, well, it was always part of something. It was never standalone. It could never support itself. Yeah. It actually started about 10 years early when we had some friends. we were operating. Uh, we had a joint lease and they their business was failing and we had to take over this extra space. The question is, what are we going to do with this extra space? We put in some books. Yeah. So that's kind of how it started in the yeah. 1970s in Dallas. Yeah. And then t 10 years later, I'm out of college and then I get involved. And then I start adding the used books. And pretty soon I realized that was the most popular part of the store. People would rock, walk right in. We gave it the worst space in the back of the store, s s just spine out. And people would just rummage through those. And they were happy to walk up with a stack of books for $30. Yeah, that, or they could get two two new books, or they could get seven, and that was eye opening for me. Yeah, to see, wow, there is an interest here. Yeah, and people still love bookstores. You know that. I mean, it's 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 a harder thing to to, to run. You've got to work it in a different way. Um, um, well, I know two thousand eight, nine, ten, the worldwide meltdown. Over half of all sto bookstores closed and yeah. never reopened, and. People have asked me why, and I said, well, first of all, I feel that most bookstore owners kind of do it out of a passion without a lot of business uh, experience, and so they kind of just kind of stay there. Um, and with all things going digital, everybody says, how does it feel? You're going to be out of business. But it's like, no, that kind of stopped about 10 years ago, and there's a resurgence. Our at least my bookstore is the traffic is increasing year by year. Yeah. I mean, you have a particularly sort of interesting stock in the way that, you know, all your books tell a story, you know, that they 
attract people by the nature of what they are. Um, and I think that will always be so. I mean, it's um, people will always be attracted by that kind of um, pulling power of, you know, stories of stories. And it's about telling, I mean, book selling is in a way about telling stories about a book and um, linking it in. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, now, back to uh, a shop. So you had an interesting story about the opening of your store. In Notting Hill. In well, Notting Hill. <laughs> I did. I had several bookstores before that, but yes, I, I opened one in Notting Hill around about the time of um, Notting Hill, the, the movie. Okay. Uh, and uh, someone introduced me to Hugh Grant and I asked you if he would um, come and open it for me. So he did. He pretended to be my assistant because that was his sort of part in the movie. And uh, okay. uh, uh, it was a great, so we had a fantastically glamorous opening party. I, did, I had a shop in Mayfair also dealing in more antiquarian old books, but the shop in Notting Hill I was dealing in modern first editions, photography, counterculture, sort of slightly more modern end of it. And I made it a you know, a very modern shop. There was no straight edges. You know, most bookshops are very linear. It was all curved edges. And it was actually very successful. I mean, not, you know, people loved it. It's what, and they, and I displayed books as objects very much. And uh, it was good fun. It was. Um, Can you tell us about any interesting customers that you had? Uh, well, that's always, I've, I've had so many. I mean, I, I think all, I mean, um, can I tell you about interesting clients that I've had? Um, you start. <laughs> uh, well, the crazy thing today is I actually have to sign NBAs with a lot of my clients, non-disclosure deals, yeah. because they don't want people to know mm. mainly what they have. Mm. And so all of my most interesting customers, I can't even tell you who they are, <laughs> but they buy books. I, I, th I think that, I mean, I think that that's the same. I mean, I did have one client I met who just sold his company for quite a lot. Who, and I, I, he was, I got on with him very well. I thought well, you'd actually really enjoy the whole process of buying books. You've got that kind of mind that would really enjoy the collecting game. And I had a first edition of Newton's Principia Mathematica, which is a valuable book. And so I, sent him a fax at the time, or I've forgotten how I communicated, saying I've got this, and he said, oh, I just bought one of those. And I thought, well, okay. So I found a Copernicus Day Revolution of this, which at the time was perhaps the most expensive book in, in the science field. And I've forgotten, I think it was, it was a lot of money, 365,000, I think, dollars at the time. And he just sent me a two-word two, two -word reply, send it. <laughs> <laughs> but he was incredible, you know, and inspiring client. So you just meet people that just suddenly get captured by the world and actually want to collect these things. Um, and it's not been a crazy thing to do with money over the time. I always think, oh gosh, you know, they're spending all this money. But, they, you know, I'm, I'm always buying books for more than I sold the, you know, the last one for, you know, that, that um, it, it seems to sort of, Good things seem to sort of catch up with themselves. Um, what? Um, so you've you, you mentioned those the scientific books, the Newton and Copernicus. Um, what's the most interesting copy of Shakespeare that you've had? Well, I've had the first folio of Shakespeare, um, sixteen twenty-three. Um, More than one? I've had two. One one complete one, which I bought at auction, you know, with a client in mind and. Um, one which was defective, but um, there was a defective copy recently at Salabis that also Christie's that brought a great deal of money, much a great deal more than I sold mine for. Um, yeah. um, what about Tolkien? Tolkien, I've never really understood. That... I've, I've had I've had inscribed copies of The Hobbit. I've had inscribed copies of Lord of the Rings, but I never I never really I've never really focused on, I feel, I've never really focused on modern first editions. I've, I've, I've had all these things, particularly when I had the shop in Notting Hill Gate, and I enjoy them, but I mean, it's probably the older books that I, I, I'm more veer to. Um, I somehow, I, I would buy these things if I came across them, but I, yeah, I mean, I know that you do, do a lot with Tolkien. Um, yeah, I... Um... I saw you had actually Tolkien's copy of the Bible, which is a uh, extraordinary thing with annotations, annotations by, yes. by Tolkien. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, people always ask me, what's your white whale? What's the one book you want to get? And I say, well, the books that I would like to get, the reason we know about them is because they're already in an institution. Yeah. They're already owned. The question is, what is out there that is going to surface? And those books continue to surface at a regular pace and they surface at book fairs like this weekend will be a book fair. And people say, what are you looking for? And I say, I'll know it when I see it. Absolutely. I, yeah. I, it, it doesn't take me long. When, when you show me something, it, okay, yeah, that, yeah. okay, I can already envision who I'm going to show it to or it fills this gap. Yeah. And like we were talking about earlier, People say, when are you going to retire? And it's like, I don't have to because I wouldn't change what I'm doing. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's just, like... and it's, it's one of those that I think you just continue. As long as you stay caught up, you just get better at what you're doing. Mm. And so I, I tell people I've yet to meet anybody I've ever trade places with as far as what I do because... Yeah. It's quite, flat, at least at this stage. In the early days, it was I had to do everything because I couldn't afford to pay anybody anything. But now I have a very, uh, you know, great crew that helps out, allows me to literally travel the world tracking down rare books and documents. It's just the best. It's, and you're always learning because the books are the stories. And when you learn about them, it just expands your knowledge horizon and your 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 view of the world so it's just it's 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 a, a fantastic occupation it really it's a privilege to, to be doing well, it and i'm also fortunate i always get to take family or friends along yeah, with yeah. me when i travel by myself then i just spend all my time looking for books and that's just what i focus on but um a trip like this is just ideal. You get to visit with uh, friends, uh, take a little break in between book fairs. So I really thank you for taking time, giving me a little sit down. And uh, we'll have to do another sit down in the future and compare notes. I'd like that very much. Thank you, Reed. Thank okay. you very much.